Hi, me again. Hope you all are well. Um, ready to dive into this experiment. So what I want to do today in this first lecture is try out some things first of all. So this is very experimental. Um, please give me feedback on what works and what doesn't. Move too fast, not move fast enough. Um, and I want to work through the first few propositions in Spinoza's Ethics, uh, getting us up to Proposition 5. Next lecture we will get through Proposition 14, um, and then the following lecture following that I'll do a sort of general overview of the rest of Spinoza's system. So what we're trying to do now is to see his overall conception worldview, his overall conception of the universe, uh, his basic metaphysics. So what you might want to do is pause this and go back and review Spinoza's definitions and axioms so that they're fresh in mind. Um, we're going to be talking about them and unpacking them as we go along, but that's what we're going to focus on here. Uh, we're going to work through the first four propositions, and then I'm going to give you an assignment to work through the fifth proposition all on your own on a worksheet. So. Think of the propositions as conclusions of an argument, and then what we're going to get is proof of those. So if we go to, for example, proposition number one, substance is by nature prior to its affections. And then the proof, he says, this is evident from definitions three and five. Could have spelled that out, of course, but we can go back to definitions three and five. Definition three is the definition of substance. Definition five is the definition of mode, right, or property, or quality, or as he says, affections. So let's remind ourselves of what those are. So by substance, he says, I mean that which is in itself and is conceived through itself. That is, that the conception of which does not require the conception of another thing from which it has to be formed. I've slightly revised that down here in this premise. We'll come back to this in a second. But he says, if a substance can exist on its own and can be thought of without thinking of anything else, right? That's what a substance is. A substance is something that can exist all on its own, doesn't depend on anything else for its existence, and doesn't depend on anything else to be thought about. I can think about it without thinking about anything else. Definition five is the definition of mode. By mode, he says, I mean the affections of substance, or properties or qualities of substance. That is, that which is in something else and is conceived through something. I've rephrased that slightly here. A mode is something which exists only in something else and which cannot be thought of except by thinking of something else. That is, if the modes by definition are dependent upon substances, uh, modes by definition are dependent upon substances in order to exist. So think about it this way, right? Um, normally when common sense would say curry is a substance and curry has the property or the mode of being bald right so baldness as we said in class cannot exist without existing in something there's no baldness floating around out there there are only bald things where thing indicates the substance that is bald right but if that's the case right then it follows pretty quickly, right? pretty obviously, that substances have to exist in order for modes to exist. There is no baldness unless there are bald things. There is no redness unless there are red things. right? So what follows from that is that substance has to be ontologically and logically prior to modes. So prior here is a little tricky, right? Uh, I think usually when we think of prior, we think of temporal priority, one kind of priority, right? Prior in time, this came before that. This was prior to that, right? Um, so obviously uh, my parents existed prior to my existing, right? Okay. But we're not talking about temporal priority here. Temporal priority is irrelevant here. Um, this proposition says nothing at all about tempor temporal priority. Um, Maybe substances and modes all came to exist at the same time. Maybe they're eternal. It says nothing at all about time. What is said is that substances have to be ontologically and logically prior to their modes. Okay. Um, that's the kind of priority we're talking about here. Okay, so that's proposition number one. 
So before we go on to proposition number two, I want to remind us a little bit about Descartes' conception of substance. Um, the handout on Descartes' notion of substance, um, which we passed out in class, is up in, um, in the Spinoza section in Teams. So remember, Descartes told us that, that the notion of substance, uh, the concept of sub substance, was equivocal. It had more than one meaning. Its primary meaning had to do with God, which he tells us is the only thing which exists absolutely independently, right? And so the only thing that, strictly speaking, fulfills the definition of substance. But he says there are also finite substances. And finite substances are things that can exist with only the concurrence of God. That's all that they require in order to exist, is the concurrence of God, is God's making them exist. And those, he tells us, are mind and body, right? The two different kinds of substances in the Cartesian system. The essence of mind is thinking. The essence of body is extension. And both he and Spinoza refer to these essences as attributes, right? And then the properties of substances are all ways of being those attributes. So there are different ways of thinking, affirming or denying or understanding or sensing. There are different ways of taking up space, being extended, right? Having a certain size, a certain shape, a certain location, a certain weight, etc. So the modes are literally ways of being the essence or the attribute, and the attribute is what we perceive of the substances. Okay. So keep that in mind because that will make the next couple of propositions a little bit clearer. So let's go on to proposition number two. So he says two substances that have different attributes have nothing in common. Here's the proof. This too is evident from definition three. For each substance must be in itself and be conceived through itself. That is, the conception of the one does not involve the conception of the other. Right? So that's just the definition of substance, which we've looked at. Yeah. And remember, he doesn't, doesn't tell us, give, us give, give it to us here, but remember what an attribute is, is that which the intellect perceives of the substance as constituting its essence. It's the essence of the sub substance, or what we perceive is the essence of the substance. So here's the argument, right? Here's what he's thinking. If two substances have different attributes, then they're perceived in two different ways, right? So we go back to our chart. They're perceived as having, uh, as thinking, a thinking thing, or they're perceived as a material thing, as a physical thing, perceived in two different ways, right? If they weren't perceived in two different ways, they wouldn't have different attributes at all. Yeah? Okay. Two thinking things, right, are not perceived in two different ways. Each then, right, if two substances have different attributes and they're perceived in two different ways, and each can exist independently and be perceived independently of the other, because that's just what it means to be a substance. So if two substances have different attributes, then they can exist independently and be perceived independently from the other. That is, two substances of different attributes are ontologically and epistemologically distinct, which is to say, in English, that one can exist without the other and the one can be thought of or known without the other. But if that's the case, then they can have nothing in common. The thought of one doesn't include anything at all about the thought of the other. Right? And we can go back and see that clearly. If I'm thinking about the shape of something, I'm not thinking about a thinking thing. Thoughts have no shape. Thoughts have no size. Right? So thinking things share no properties at all with physical things. Physical things share no properties at all with thinking things. So this leads us directly then into proposition number three. So what he tells us is that when things have nothing in common, one cannot be the cause of the other. Well, this follows from axiom five and axiom four. So first axiom five, tells us that things which have nothing in common with each other cannot be understood through each other. That is, the conception of the one does not involve the conception of the other. So thinking about bodies doesn't, in, 
it, it doesn't um, require me to think about minds. Thinking about mental states doesn't require me to think about physical states. I don't have to think about the size of my thoughts or the shape of my thoughts, right? Okay. So they can't be understood through one another. And then, axiom four, the knowledge of an effect depends upon and involves the knowledge of the cause. Okay. Putting those two together, it follows that two substances, which have different attributes or essences, since they have nothing in common, cannot be understood the one through the other, nor can the one cause the other. So from that, what follows from that, going back, is that minds can't cause bodies and bodies can't cause minds, right? Okay. The causes are different. The one cannot cause the other. Remember how this affects Descartes. Inter Descartes' conception of dualism and leads to the interaction problem. We wonder in the interaction problem with dualism, how can an immaterial thing act on a material thing? Or how can a material thing act on an immaterial thing? Right? And the fundamental worry there is precisely that they have no properties in common and so how can the one affect the other? Right? Have an effect upon the other. Okay, so far so good. So let's go on to proposition number four. This one's a little tricky. Not as tricky as five, but it's a little tricky. So he tells us that two or more distinct things are distinguished from one another either by the difference of the substances or by the difference of the affections of the substances. And here's his proof. All things that are, are either in themselves or in something else, right? That is to say, of course, that they are either substances or the modes or properties of substances. Right? That is, nothing exists outside the mind except substances and their properties. Therefore, he says, there can be nothing external to the intellect through which several things can be distinguished from one another except substances or, which is the same thing, the attributes and the affections of substances. So this one is really key to understanding the next proposition, Proposition 5. Right? So think about this for a minute. When I have two distinct things, remember how this was inter related to Descartes' um, notion of the real distinction as well. When I have two distinct things, right, or two things that I believe to be distinct, I distinguish between them by pointing to a property that the one has that the other one doesn't have. Okay, so let's imagine two copies of the same book. I want to distinguish between them, right? I did these backwards. Right? And the way we normally distinguish between two things is to point to some property that the one has that the other one doesn't have. Right? So this one, oh, wrong, this one, right, has a slightly bent cover. Right? That's a property that this one doesn't have. And therefore I know that these are two distinct things. Right? I also know they're two distinct things because they um, are, are in different locations. Yeah, this one's here, this one's here. Yeah. So. Um, that are distinguished uh, by their modes, by different, by their properties. Another way to distinguish between two things would just be if we already knew that they were two distinct substances, right? So the only way to distinguish things is to either say, look, two substances, or, right, by a difference in substance, or a difference in attribute, right, because that's what we perceive of the substance, or a difference in modes, right? And that's all we need to get, get us proposition for, right? Two or more distinct things are distinguished from another, either by a difference of the attributes, okay, thinking thing and a um, physical thing, remember, they share no properties, right? Or by a difference of the properties or the qualities or the affections of the, subju uh, of the substances. Those are the only two ways of distinguishing one thing from another. Okay, that puts us in a position to go to proposition number five. So, so far, Descartes and Spinoza are in perfect agreement. Everything that Spinoza has put forward so far in his ethics, Descartes would accept. Okay. But then we come to proposition number five. So here, 
right? Proposition 5 says, in the universe, there cannot be two or more substances of the same nature or attribute. Right? In the universe, there cannot be two or more substances of the same nature or attribute. But of course, that's not what Descartes believes. He thinks that there are lots of minds, right? And we haven't really talked about this. He may agree with Spinoza that there is only one material substance, but he thinks that there are at least lots of minds. There's my mind and your mind, right? And everybody else's mind. So here's his proof. And I'm just going to read this to you because I want you to sort this out on your own. He says, if there were several such substances, they would have to be distinguished from one another, either by a difference of attributes or by a difference of affections. That was Proposition 4. And then we get the argument. If they are distinguished only by a difference of attributes, then it will be granted that there cannot be more than one substance of the same attribute. But if they are distinguished by a difference of affections, then, since substance is by nature prior to its affections, disregarding, that was Proposition 1, remember, Disregarding, therefore, its affections and considering substance in itself, that is definitions 3 and axiom 6, that is considering it truly, it cannot be conceived as distinguishable from another substance. That is, there cannot be several such substances, but only one. So here's your mission. Your mission is going to be to answer the following two questions on the next page. You can find a worksheet for this assignment in the Spinoza channel in our Teams. You'll also find a folder there to deposit your finished worksheet into. So I want you to practice sort of what we've been doing today, unpacking Spinoza's arguments, and unpack this one in particular by answering the following two questions. What fundamental part of the Cartesian, that is Descartes' worldview, is Proposition 5 rejecting? And I've already indicated, pointed pretty clearly towards that one, the answer to that one. And then the more difficult part. Can you translate Spinoza's argument for Proposition 5 into something more understandable? That is, what really is his argument here? Try to express it in its most basic form. Basically, that would be to answer the question, why can't there be two or more substances of the same nature? Why can't there be two or more substances which share, which have the same essence? Okay. And think back to Proposition 4 here. <clears throat> How would I distinguish them from one another if there were two or more substances of the same nature? And that takes us to what we were talking about with regard to Proposition 4. How do I distinguish between any two things? Okay, so that's where we are for today. Um, see if you can do that worksheet in the next couple of days. Uh, we'll go over a little bit of it um, at the beginning of the next lecture, which I will try to get up uh, early next week. So this one should go up um, sometime Saturday night or early Sunday morning. Um, again, let me know your issues. Uh, I hope you've tracked down the text either through the links that I put on the page if you want to track down our actual text and get an e-copy of that for free. Um, there are those links at the top of our, our, of our Teams page um, or by using the Early Modern Texts um, website. Again, let me know if there are any issues um, and uh, I hope to make these a little bit more lively in the future. This is just the beginning. Hang in there. Talk to you soon.